Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome you all to my talk on China's avant-garde fiction. Uh, for those of you, of you who are not quite familiar with contemporary Chinese literature, when you see this key word, avant-garde, its defining term, uh, you may wonder that whether it is about the most latest, uh, uh, most latest trend literary phenomenon in contemporary China now. So in nowadays China, what has the most up-to-date, most latest uh, literary phenomenon, literary genre, literary uh, school now. So here I list some latest Chinese literary trends and genre. So the first one, the new wave science fiction. And this kind of new wave science fiction are quite different from the 1980s science fiction writings. And some of you may have already read this uh, three body, yeah, yeah, problem by Liu Cixin, and this fiction won the last year's Hugo Award uh, for the best novel. And this one, Folding Beijing, and written by Hao Jingfang, and uh, it also won the best uh, won this year's best uh, uh, novelette of Hugo Award. Um, so of these fictions um, are, are the latest. Uh, literary trend in nowadays China, and they gain their fame not only domestically but also internationally. Okay, so the second one, uh, the dialect written fictions. So this kind of fiction are not written in standard Mandarin, but written in different dialects and about different local uh, people's lives. Um, and, um, and like this one, uh, written by Yan Ge, The Family of Joy, and uh, Fan Hua by a Shanghainese uh, uh, writer. And this one was written in Sichuanese, and this one was written by, uh, in Shanghainese. So none of them was written in standard Chinese. So by using the dialect, these two fictions, they challenge the normative standard using of uh, Chinese language in their fictional writings. And the last one, some different kinds of online literature or cyber literature. So they could be consist of uh, the fan fictions called Tong Ren Xiao Shuo and BL manga or BL fiction, Dan Mei Xiao Shuo, and also uh, this, this, one, San, this one as a representative work, San Sheng San Shi Shi Li Tao Hua. And it is a kind of Asian Chinese style romantic fictions, Gu uh, Feng Yan Qing Xiao Shuo. So um, this third uh, genre or third school of literature, they also provide some new imaginations, provide, show some new features and characteristics in literary writing nowadays. Uh, they provide uh, new imaginations of gender relationships, and they also emphasis um, the subjectivity, emphasis the agency of uh, the reader, the fans, instead of the authoritative writer, author. And uh, just the day before yesterday, uh, one of the year two students of our China studies, and she told me that now she is writing a fan fiction series on a very famous online BBS, online literature BBS called uh, Jingjiang, Jingjiang Wen Xue Cheng. So now you know how, where to find those new generation authors. But what I'm going to talk about today, the avant-garde fiction, are not about this up-to-date, innovative uh, literary explorations, but about the literary experiment, experimentation that was launched 30 years before, was, uh, that was uh, written in 1980s China. So the first decade of, uh, uh, the fir very first decade of the post mao era. So nowadays, there are a lot of publications about 1980s China, um, and there are some me personal memoirs, and there are some interviews and also oral history about uh, 1980s China. If we look at the titles of these publications, uh, let me sing songs for the 1980s, uh, in memory of 1980s, and here in the 21st century, uh, let me pay a tribute to the 1980s China. So from these titles, you could see that this 1980s China really means a lot to a number, a great number of Chinese people. Okay. 
So why this uh, 1980s is a, a very remarkable era? Because it is um, the first decade of the reform era. It is a very important transitional period of China from the Mao era to post-Mao era, from the socialist China to post-socialist China. So uh, let us first look at this keyword, this defining term, avant-garde. So avant-garde is a French. It has an old history in French as early as the Middle Ages, and it has already been used as a term for, of warfare. And beginning from the Renaissance, um, besides the uh, literal meaning, um, it has already developed a kind of figurative meaning. But only until the 19th century. And um, the avant-garde was used as a metaphor, has, been re has reached a certain agreement. So it means uh, the self-consciously advanced position in politics, religion, literature, and art. So not only literature and art, but also politics and religion. And in 1870s in French, and this word avant-garde has been used to designate a group of advanced artists and writers uh, which began to put their social, radical social critique into their own artistic expressions. And uh, from then on, this word avant-garde gained uh, acquired a kind of literary artistic focused meaning. So it began to designate all the new schools featured by their rejection of the old and their cult of the new. So what do we mean by avant-garde as a, as a cultural metaphor? So it means um, non-orthodox, non-conformatist, and anti-traditional, not traditional. It could be radical, and it, uh, it should be experimental, it should be innovative in their artistic expressions, explorations, and also it is part of elite culture. It should be opposite to both mainstream official culture and to, uh, should stand in the opposite side of the mass culture. So this is a very famous quotation by this uh, French dramatist, um, UNESCO. So quote, I prefer to define the avant-garde in terms of opposition and rupture. Avant-garde is, uh, is the opponent of the existing system. Okay. So throughout the 20th century, and this term avant-garde has been used to refer to a great number of uh, artistic movements at the beginning, modernist and later the postmodernist uh, artistic uh, schools, genres, um, artistic, and also their works. So, um, if we look for a complete guide of avant-garde, we could find that we could find that all these different schools in visual art, uh, literature, and poetry, music, um, cinema, and theater and they have had been labeled as a vanguard uh, uh, due to their uh, innovative artistic expressions one after another. And we may also know that uh, yesterday's vanguard could be today's cliche. So, um, so people tend to use this term to label the most updated artistic uh, explorations. Now let's go back to 1980s China um, and let's see what's special about this first decade of post mao era. So there are profound political and economical uh, transformations, changes happened in this era and this uh, um, very uh, dramatic social transformations also brought uh, the uh, dramatic uh, changes in social, uh, in cultural development. So in uh, 1980s China, um, this ideologically unified culture began to collapse. And uh, if we look at this special uh, year, 19, uh, 1986, and there appeared an urgency for political reform voiced by Deng Xiaoping and also by other uh, party officials. 
and there is increasing uh, creative freedom in the realm of uh, uh, art. And, um, but we know that the ideological control did not totally disappear in these three, uh, year, three years, um, 1981, 1983, and 1987, witnessed the um, reappearance of political campaign. The political campaign launched against the so-called bourgeois liberalism. So those uh, reappeared politi uh, political campaign actually um, caused, um, actually brought the dystopian mood among not only intellectuals but also uh, common people. And but but we should also know that then these political campaigns cannot reach the same strong effect as the former events uh, uh, took place in the socialist era. And, and if we look at the economic sphere, um, as the market reform has greatly uh, altered the lifestyle of people, and it has accelerated the process of individualization. But if we look at the, sphere, the cultural sphere, the realm of culture, and we should know that um, this cultural realm, cultural sphere, still kept a certain distance with the effects of market. So that is the fundamental cultural logic of 1980s hasn't become the market driven yet. So if we briefly, very briefly, divide it into the culture of 1980s into three parts, mainstream, uh, mass culture, and elite culture, and we will find that, we will find that uh, because of the, uh, uh, the less ideological control, the mainstream official culture has to a large extent been weakened and um, because uh, commercialization has been dominant, has become a dominant phenomenon in, in Chinese society. So the mass culture um, haven't been fully developed. So this is provide a, a space for the elite culture. The elite culture gained its prosperity in 1980s China. So there are different innovative artistic explorations in 1980s China, especially um, in the golden era, which is uh, 19, uh, which is the mid and the late 1980s. So if we look at um, uh, the, uh, the art sphere, um, there is a vanguard contemporary art movement, and in 1985 there has already appeared a new wave in fine art. And this is, um, this is photographer. This is photography and fine art and, uh, and, and other uh, forms, other genres of art. And 1980, um, 1989, um, there appeared the first uh, uh, modern art exhibition was launched in Beijing. And if we look at the film, uh, field of cinema, and we also notice um, the new wave cinema appeared in, 90, uh, in mid 1980s and represented by the fifth generation directors like uh, this, Yellow Earth, this Yellow Earth directed by Chen Kai Ge and this uh, Black Candle Incident directed by Huang Jianxing. And this film was uh, really marked as, labeled as a cinematic, cinematic avant-gardism because of their new, ex new thematic <laughs> explorations and also their adoptions of new filmic languages. So not only the content, but also the um, filmic techniques and forms. So if you look at the field of theater, there appeared um, experimental theaters like uh, Absolute Signal by uh, so uh, by uh, Lin Zhaohua and Gao Xingjian, and also a bus stop by Gao Xingjian. And this is a stage photo of bus stop. And in the field of poetry writing, there also appeared uh, new uh, artistic, new uh, innovative expressions like this group of writers called Mystic Poetry, Meng Long Shi. So uh, uh, some famous poets you may already uh, being very familiar with Beidao, Shu, uh, Shu Ting, Gu Cheng, uh, are also part of this group. And also newborn generation poetry, uh, like, Han, uh, like Han Dong. 
Um, so if we focus on the uh, field of literature, and we will notice that um, there was from the beginning of 1980s, there was large scale introduction and translation of 20th century uh, modern Western theory and modernist uh, uh, literature. And here I listed some schools of thoughts and school of arts. So different kind of isms was introduced and translated into China. And because after, uh, after the Cultural Revolution, uh, Chinese intellectuals developed a similar worldview like the, uh, of the uh, Western modernist art. And they began to be fed up with the realism, especially socialist realism. So uh, this Western modernist, moder modernist literature and modernism became the new resources, important resources and, and inspirations for them. So here are some uh, writers' names uh, whose works has been introduced and translated into China and greatly influenced the Chinese uh, uh, modernist writing. So under the great influence of these uh, modernist works, and there are four innovative literary schools appeared in 1980s China, um, modernist fiction, route seeking, avant-garde, and new realist fiction. And I choose avant-garde to talk about is because that it is the most radical um, artistic experiment innovations among these four schools. So here comes the avant-garde school, Xian Feng Pai, and it is um, it was uh, experimental fictional practices by a cluster of young writers under the ages of literary journal Harvest and uh, 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 during the mid and late 1980s. So it was greatly influenced by those modernist theory and artist works, and it's, they stepped further into the innovations of uh, literary styles and pursuit of postmodernism um, compared with the, the former modernist literary experiments represented by Liu Suola and um, Xu Xing. Um, so every artistic school and movement has their manifesto. Um, so here's the manifesto of the vanguard school. It is was an essay written by a very famous writer, Yu Hua. Um, and here is the original Chinese text. And uh, Yu Hua, and he argues that a deceptive style, so here by deceptive, he actually means fabricated or artificial. Uh, a deceptive style form uh, could help one approach the real, the truth. Um, but the realism style in the past only leads to a superficial reality. And he also talked about the relationship between language and reality. So you could see this ling uh, linguistic turn also happened in the uh, field of Chinese literature. Uh, so he argues that the language constructs, uh, constructs but not uh, reflects ideas or reality. So um, now I will, I will introduce to you some representative authors and the works of this school, avant-garde school. Um, first is Ma Yuan. He is one of the two for, one of the two forerunners of this school, and he's famous for his experiments in narrative techniques. And Ma Yuan, in his fictions, he explicitly uh, indicates that his fiction is an invention, is a fabrication. And he's famous for his a lot of uh, Tibetan stories, like this one, uh, the Lu of the Gandhi's uh, Gandhi si de Yuhuo. And he adopts an anti-traditional, a very modernist way to narrate uh, mysterious uh, Tibetan stories. And another Tibetan uh, writer, Jia Xi Dawan, and he uh, was usually mentioned together with Ma Yuan because they are both famous for their uh, Tibetan stories. And like, this is the most famous one, Tibet, a soul knocked on a, a leather. So these two writers, uh, when they wrote about the Tibetan stories, they did not adopt a logical or rationalized way to uh, uh, narrate of seeing the religious and 
traditions of Tibetan culture, but they adopt a fragmented, non-linear, and multiple perspective way to narrate the Tibetan stories. And in this way, they challenge the dominant, normative, or essentialized way of seeing a non-Han, uh, a not Han, non-Han culture. Uh, so they are. Um, uh, revolution in of their uh, literary forms or skills actually provide a perfect platform for their uh, transcultural reflections. So they do not uh, adopt this logical way of narrating the Tibetan story, but they use a modernist or postmodernist way uh, to uh, const uh, to deconstruct the essentialized other. Okay. So uh, next one, Tan Xue, and she is another forerunner of this uh, avant-garde school, and she is uh, she is called, sometimes called uh, Chinese Kafka, and she was one of the most distinctive voices of this school, and was famous for her representation of evil and violence by using uh, a lot of non-realistic images. So later, I will give. A close reading of his of her uh, representative work, Hat um, Hat on the Mountain. If we uh, look at the book covers of Tan Xue's works, we we just find that uh, those publishers they really like to use uh, modernist artworks to uh, represent Tan Xue's works. And you could also see some uh, labels uh, used by uh, the publishers. Uh, Tan Xue, China's most interesting and most creative writer. And here there is, uh, there is work by uh, Susan, uh, uh, American critic Susan Sontag. If China has one possibility of a Nobel uh, Lurinet, it is Tan Xue. So, can also, if we look at this book cover, can you identify who, who, whose work? So it is Yue Mingjun. Yeah, so it is very, uh, another famous avant-garde Chinese artist work, uh, uh, Yue Mingjun's laughter series paintings. So the artistic modernism here was linked with uh, literary modernism. So if the prediction of Susan Sontag finally proved to be not true, um, the real Nobel Prize winner for literary, uh, Chinese Nobel winner uh, uh, for literature, Mo Yan, and she, he also was labeled as one of the avant-gardist uh, uh, for his earlier work, like uh, Red Sorghum, uh, Five Dreams, Transparent Radishes. And Mo Yan was uh, uh, famous for his rich sensory images and his uh, talented descriptions of feelings and sensations. But Mo Yan is, of course, you know, he's very, uh, uh, wrote a lot of works and his uh, proofreak. And she and he is uh, stylistic, and he has uh, too much styles. So later, he was not categorized into only one school, only the avant-garde. And Hong Feng, also another representative uh, uh, author of avant-garde school, and um, her work is similar to Ma Yuan's on their, uh, they emphasize the fabricated nature of uh, narration of their storytelling. And Yu Hua, very important uh, writer of this avant-garde school, and he's famous for his fascination of writing death and violence. So if I just recommend one novel, uh, one fiction of his, I will recommend this one, um, 1986. So it was a story about a man who was persecuted in uh, the Cultural Revolution, and he was exiled far away from his hometown, and several years after he finally come back from, uh, come back to his hometown, and uh, 
he find that he could not bear the uh, mental suffering. He could not bear the traumatic memories, and finally commit suicide. So this man was not uh, died of the real persecution, but died of the traumatic experiences, the trauma caused by uh, the by the uh, persecution. And uh, Ge Fei and Su Tong, and uh, they too, uh, they are famous for their alternative, they provide alternative uh, uh, way of writing Chinese history, especially uh, history, Chinese history of Republican era. So they uh, like to write pers personal stories, family stories, which are mysterious and which um, uh, did not uh, have any cause and effects in their uh, storytelling, and their, uh, their version of Chinese history is full of contingency and also sometimes full of fatalism. And Sun Gan Lu and, and, and he's very famous for his uh, poetic languages. And if we look at uh, this work of, hi of him, and if we divided this story into uh, into lines like poems, and we will find that this is a very good poem, instead of a story, instead of a fiction. And Bei Chun, and he's also famous for his uh, religious dimension. So the what's the other? characteristics of this avant-garde school, what are the, uh, some common thematic features. So there's no social political centered subjects or authentic, um, no social political centered subjects like uh, scar literature, reform literature, or introspective literature, which is, was popular in the beginning of 1980s. And, it were, and they, they are not about uh, uh, the searching, the request of the authentic Chinese cultural roots, which was the uh, main thematic concern of a uh, root-seeking school. And there was no rational or logical stories, no direct connections between events in the story and the real world. And a lot of writers like Yu Hua, Tan Xue, and they uh, took great thematic interest in topics, themes like death, sex, uh, evil and violence. So Ge Fei and uh, Su Tong are also fascinated about writing about death and sex. And they have new attitudes towards history and there's no ground narrative of history. And they reject the official socialist historiography and even the historical casuality. Artistic features and um, um, they were uh, well known for their experiment in literary forms and narrative techniques. And even the, like Ma Yuan, he tend to reveal the artificiality, um, uh, uh, to reveal the fabricated nature of st storytelling. And they challenge the realism by using techniques of international modernism and even postmodernism. And they are evidence of uh, literary postmodernity, like uh, the preference for surfaces over uh, psychological depths. Uh, so now I would like to uh, introduce to you this very uh, 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 famous work of Tan Xue and his, uh, her representative work uh, written in 1945, 1985, uh, Heart on the Mountain. It was a haunting story um, although I told you that there's no rational, logical stories uh, provided by, by those uh, writers, I tried my best to summarize the storyline of this uh, fiction for you. So what was uh, this story about? So no one in the family except I, the narrator, here a man who is locked up in the heart on the mountain behind the house, howling furious, uh, furious against the door. I climb the mountain to check, but it's blocked by sunshine and tiny white flames of the pebbles. 
Every day, I tidy up my desk drawers, and these days annoy another other family members. Mother, my mother is driving crazy by my opening and shutting of the drawers, so she even thinks of breaking my arms. My drawers are made messy, and a few treasures of mine are thrown when I am out. My chess set is buried by them beside the well behind the house. I have to dig it out. I oil the sides of the drawer to avoid making noises. But Mom turns off the light of my room. Father does not know whether、um, he lost a pair of scissors in the well twenty years ago is real or not.、Um, this troubles him for twenty years. When he finally tries to fish them out, he failed. The hair on his left temple turns completely white,、um, but he continues to give a try in his dream. I climb the mountain again to search for the heart and the locked man, but seeing nothing but the white pebbles,、uh, glowing with flames. So after you、uh, know the basic storyline of this fiction, have you sensed any avant-gardeism from it? So, how to decipher this story? What does the writer want to express? Want to、um, represent? So, here are uh, um, here are some original paragraphs from the story. There are so many thieves wandering about our house in the、uh, moonlight. When I turn on the light, I can see countless tiny holes poked by fingers in the window screen. I hear wolves howling. They keep running around the house. Sometimes they poke their heads in through the cracks in the door. So, how to、uh, interpret this avant-gardeist fiction? So, is it a political allegory?、Um, could、uh, maybe the heart could?、Uh, Be a symbol of the repressive social atmosphere and the social historical confinement, and the peeping, the surveillance represented by the images in the story, could allude to the prevalent social maladies during the political movement. And this recurrent image of bodily swelling could allude to the traumatic past exp- bodily experiences. Um, because Tan Xue, her own grandma, was dead of the, a severe、uh, a disease called edema,、uh, and the one of the characteristic features of this、um, illness is a、uh, bodily swelling. And loss of scissors could also be a metaphor of loss of personal rights of intellectuals,、um, because Tan Xue his. Father was、uh, an editor for a news- newspaper, and scissors at that time was an important tool for her in her、uh, in his work. So the loss of scissors could also mean the、uh, loss of、uh, rights of writing and expression opinions. So political allegory, it could be a way of reading this fiction, and also we could also read it at, as a modernist fable. So、um, Tan Xue was labeled as a Chinese Kafka, and if we we could think of Kafka's metamorphosis and the cas- and the castle after we read her fiction, Hai Chang's Mountain, and it could be、uh, and this story could be an abstract. Symbolic writing of、uh, human versus environment, self versus other. So, like the satyr's、uh, theater, no exit. It could also be a way to express absurdity of human life. And the essence of relations between people, indifference, hostility. And also could be a metaphor or symbolism of the frustration of human struggle 
uh, of their pursuit of internal spiritual world. And we could also read this text as a kind of feminist politics. So the deconstruction of the myth of family. So the family members linked by blood and familial attachment has been collapsed. Has been collapsed. So the uh, um, collapse of this myth of family. And um, the representation of an oppressive um, power of mother, not the traditional uh, women's imagery of warmth and affection. And this representation of the paranoid persona could also be a symbol of women's mentality in the male dominant society. And also the most important masculine attribute of uh, uh, which is uh, language. So here, Tan Xue appropriate a non-logical, non-rational way, but fluid language style. So this is also kind of feminist textual politics. So when some uh, literary critics, they comment on the achievement of avant-garde, they tend to emphasize um, emphasize uh, uh, the reform, their reforms in the uh, their revolution of the forms, their reforms, their innovations on their narrative skills, narrative techniques, and um, some literary critics they summarize that um, this avant-garde school they adopt a irrelevant attitude towards history and culture and. Um, here is a quotation by uh, a critic Wang Jing. Um, the the avant-garde heroes and heroines drive nowhere. Um, they only drift. So, so they tend to emphasize um, the, revolution, uh, the avant-garde revolution on their skills, forms, techniques, instead of their, um, uh, instead of what they want to express, they just emphasize they made a great achievement in how to narrate story instead of uh, what they want to express. But here I tend to uh, disagree this argument. And this, this avant-garde school, they have irre re irrelevant attitudes actually towards not um, history and culture, but they uh, adopt an irrelevant attitude towards Big history or grand narrative of history, all kind of history um, informed by progressive ideas, uh, informed by nationalism or humanism. So they just want to uh, express an alternative way of history. And um, literary critics they also tend to uh, celebrate that the avant gardists they now get rid of all the burdens of. Uh, suffered by traditional Chinese writers like social political burdens, historical burdens, cultural burdens, and even language semantic burdens. But I, what I want to argue that behind their playfulness, behind their experimentation of literary skills and techniques, and actually these avant-gardists, they have their ambitions, they have their own agenda, and their political assertions. If we read again Yu Hua's uh, manifesto, a deceptive style could have one approach the real, the truth. The really, uh, realism style in the past only leads to a superficial reality. So this um, endeavor to find out the truth was revealed in this uh, argument. And if we read uh, a very famous uh, contemporary artist Paul Klee's um, argument about art. Art does not reproduce what we see, rather it makes us see. So we could find the similar attitudes here. So what I want to argue is that um, the, uh, for those avant-gardists, their revolution in forms, in uh, techniques, in their uh, uh, narrative skills, 
they actually contains intrinsic political meanings and embeds social or political edge. So I would like to conclude my uh, talk today by this very uh, famous uh, uh, quotation uh, of a contemporary poet, writer, and also uh, us, uh, us, um, important intellectual. Art should disturb the comfortable uh, and comfort the disturbs. And for those avant-garde, maybe art should disturb the comfortable uh, means a lot to them. So we should not only just uh, see that they uh, revolutionize, innovate their literary, uh, literary uh, skills and techniques, but they also embed important social and political edge in their own uh, innovative writings. Okay, thank you.